Hello Year 13 Chemists, welcome to TP's Chemistry Cuts. In this clip we'll look at how to recalculate iron concentrations when two solutions of different ionic salts are mixed together and then calculate and use an ionic product or reaction quotient to predict precipitation formation. Now as I've said we're coming to the last part of the first section of aqueous solution where we're dealing with uh, partially soluble or slightly soluble uh, ionic salts. Uh, so, so far we've worked out solubility, we've looked at how we do that using the solubility product and we can calculate solubility product if we know the solubility. Um, also um, looked at common ion effects uh, and used equilibrium principles to explain it and also do some calculations involving it. The last step in this uh, part is to look at precipitation reactions. So we're going to start off by actually saying what those are because many of you won't have come across them. So once we've got the idea of a precipitation reaction then we can use the numbers associated with the solubility product to predict whether or not precipitation will occur when you add two things together depending on their concentration. So let's start off by defining what we mean by a precipitation reaction. It involves ionic salts and you start off with the premise that you have two soluble salts and when you mix them together uh, you form an insoluble salt with one of the products and that comes out of solution and a soluble salt is left behind. And the classic example of this is where you take sodium chloride and you add it to silver nitrate. Okay, so let's put the definition down and go through that example. Okay, so if we take the example, as I said, of taking silver nitrate, and we add that to sodium chloride, then what we do is just basically swap over the anions from the two salts and you'll form silver chloride which is insoluble so it comes out as a solid, it precipitates out of solution hence the name of the reaction and you leave behind sodium nitrate in solution. Now that's a, a very simplified way of looking at this putting everything as individual compounds and so on. What in fact is happening is these are all ionic salts that are in solution and so these aren't together, they're separated. So if we allow for that, if I do this in a slightly different code to allow for it, then what we've got is Ag plus Ag plus NO3 minus Ag plus Na plus Ag plus Cl minus Ag and that's giving AgCl solid. That's not in solution anymore, so we have to write it out as a whole entity. And plus Na plus Aq plus NO3 minus Aq. Now if you look carefully at that equation, it's pretty extensive and it doesn't need to be. When you do a, a chemical equation like this, what you're doing is just saying these are the reactants that react together to give products. If you look at this equation though, what we've got are two things here, nitrate and sodium, which are both reactants and products. So they're not actually doing anything. Okay, those are what we call what? Spectator ions, okay? So nitrate and sodium are just spectator ions, so we can ignore them because they're not really part of this precipitation reaction. So we can cross them out. And so that equation here simplifies to simply Ag plus plus Cl minus Aq going to AgCl solid. Okay, so that's the actual precipitation reaction. And this is what we would call at level 2, or level 1 as it is now for us, a net ionic equation. 
thinking, look at that carefully. It is, in fact, the reverse of what we've been looking at. We've been looking at taking a uh, sparingly soluble salt like silver chloride and trying to dissolve it into water, and then we get an equilibrium setup. We're just doing the reverse. We're starting off with oversaturation, and it's precipitating out, and you've still got this, in fact, should, in reality, be a reversible reaction. Okay. <laughs> so because of that, we can actually predict when this happens, or even if it's going to happen. Okay. So there's two things we need to look at, first of all, uh, before we can actually do the prediction. The first thing is the fact we're adding two solutions together, and we've talked, uh, we talked about this last lesson. When you add two solutions together, what you're doing is increasing the volume of solvent. But you're not changing the amounts of the ions in solution. Okay, those are staying the same when you initially do them. So what's actually happening before the precipitation reaction is you're effectively diluting everything. And that's always the case. When you add two things together in solution, you get a dilution effect. And that's something that we'll, we need to remember when we come to do titration curves, for example, where we're adding an acid and a base solution, the volume's increasing, but the amounts of acid or base, or whatever it is you're forming, is staying the same. So you're getting the dilution effect. Okay, so that's the first thing. And the other thing is we need to introduce something about the uh, equilibrium constant, but not quite the equilibrium constant, because when we first mix these two together, these two together, sorry, what we've got is not something that's at equilibrium. Okay? That's why the precipitation reaction occurs, is because it's gone past the equilibrium, it's oversaturated, and so the solid comes out of solution. So we need something to represent that instant of mixing together, what are our ratio of reactants to products? In other words, something like the equilibrium constant, but an instantaneous snapshot of the relative concentrations of the reactants to products. And what we'll do then is we can actually compare that to the equilibrium <coughs> constant. It will tell us whether or not a precipitation reaction will occur. And now that doesn't make a lot of sense because there's none of the detail there, but that's what we're going to do in this lesson. So the first thing we need to do is we need to make an allowance for the fact that when we've added these two things together, we get a change in volume of solvent, and so that's diluting. Okay, so before you can do any calculation, you've got to recalculate all your concentrations based on this dilution effect. Okay, so let's put a little bit of a uh, preamble about that and then go through how we do it. Okay, now this is the same... Uh, equation that you'll use for all dilution effects. It's not just for this one. Okay, so when we come to look at uh, <coughs> titration curves, and you've got a recalculated concentration because of the dilution effect, this is the one that you will use. So it's worth highlighting this. Okay, very simple. And of course, we should be putting in units. Now, because you're dealing with the ratio here, you don't have to convert your volumes from um, mils to uh, litres because it basically self-cancels. But you must make sure, of course, that both volumes are in mils or both volumes are in litres to be consistent. So that's what you're going to need to do before you do any other calculation. So that's our first point. Okay, so the next thing is <coughs> what we want is the equivalent <coughs> of an equilibrium constant, and it's not an equilibrium constant, it gives you the ratio of products to reactants, but it's at a snapshot at any one point. So you calculate it in exactly the same way as you would an equilibrium constant, and for this we're going to be reversing that reaction and putting it as an equilibrium. But if it's at a certain point where we're not at equilibrium, it's what we call the reaction quotient. So that's the next thing. Okay? And you'll see how the reaction quotient and this uh, dilution effect come together when we can predict precipitation. Okay? So, reaction quotient. Now in typical fashion, 
to make sure that we mystify this, we start using bizarre symbols that suddenly don't make any sense. When you get to senior level, they get more and more uh, esoteric, uh, and it's there to make you more impressive when you quote them. So the reaction quotient is given the symbol Q subscript to S. Good, eh? Uh, QS is just a general value. So say you're carrying out a reaction, it may be one that takes time, for example, and at one point you want to know exactly what the ratio of reactants to products is in terms of their concentrations. Well, that's what QS is. Okay? So it's just the same, it's calculated exactly the same as the equilibrium constant. In fact, the equilibrium constant is a special example of QS when a reaction has reached equilibrium. Okay, so it's not that QS is a form of uh, KS, it's KS is actually a special point in the reaction where you've got equilibrium. So what we're going to do when we come to predict uh, precipitation is we're going to use this equation here to calculate our concentration, uh, concentration of ions and then using those concentration of ions we're going to calculate a value of QS. So that's the concentration of ions when we just mix the two soluble salts together. So it's the concentration at the very beginning of the reaction. And then we're going to compare QS, which we get from that calculation, to the value of KS. And what you'll see is if QS is higher than the value or larger than the value of Ks, it means you've got a much higher concentration of ions than you would have at the equilibrium, so you get a precipitation reaction. If it's lower than Qs, then you've got a lower concentration than you would get at the equilibrium, so you get no precipitation reaction. It's as simple as that. Okay? And if it's equal to the Qs, then you have got equilibrium, but no precipitation because there isn't enough to precipitate out. So any addition, further addition of the salt would precipitate out. Okay? Okay, so let's have a look at how we apply both of these two things to predicting the precipitation reaction, whether or not it will ha happen. Okay? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use this example to show how we would use the two bits of information we've looked at, the uh, dilution effect and the reaction quotient to predict whether a precipitate would form when uh, those two things are able to get Now, for the benefit of those of you that haven't learned about solubility rules at level one, the answer is right in front of you, which is the precipitate, because it's given you with P and P I2, so the value of Ks. Okay? So you don't have to know about which ones precipitate, because you're told, basically, by the limit of Ks by which they precipitate. So the first thing you need to do is to write out that equation. Okay. So uh, we've got PbI2 solid, and we are forming Pb2 plus, and 2i minus, this is an Ab2 salt. Okay. So Ks is equal to the concentration of Pb2 plus uh, times the concentration of I minus all squared. Okay? And so is QS. Okay, so that's the important thing. So we can, once we've mixed the two solutions together and we've calculated the diluted concentrations, we can substitute those diluted concentrations into this equation to calculate QS, which is calculated in the same way as KS. So, that's the first thing we need to do now, is to calculate the diluted concentrations. So, let's have a look at the concentration of PB2+. Plus. So, the original concentration of PB2+, plus is 3 times 10 to the minus 2. And we're going to take that times the original volume. Remember, we don't need to convert it to litres, provided we have both of the uh, volumes in mils. That's fine. And we're going to end up, when we mix the two solutions together, with 900. So that's 400 plus 500. I'll put it in just so you know where that 900's come from. 
Could somebody please for me? Zero point zero one three three. If we look at uh, I minus, okay, this is where uh, you've got to be careful. Don't start, because it says 2 here, don't start multiplying by 2. You've got to look at the concentration in the solution we're dealing with. And here, we're using KI solution, which is a 1 to 1. So it's 4.0 ti times 10 to the minus 4 mole per litre of KI, which is 4.0 times 10 to the minus 4 mole per litre of I minus. Yeah, because it's an AB salt. It's not going to be doubled just because there's two down here. Yeah. But there could be people who think, oh, there's two here, so I need to start multiplying concentration of I minus times 2. Mm -hmm. It doesn't relate to this yet. What we're using is Ki solution in the original mixture. Okay, that's what we're doing. And it's a 4.0 times 10 to the minus 4 mole per litre Ki solution. So Ki is AB. Yeah? So if I had one of those, I'll get one of these, I'll get 1K plus and 1I minus. So if I've got 4 times 10 to the minus 4, I've got 4 times 10 to the minus 4 of these, 4 times 10 to the minus 4 of that, and 4 times 10 to the minus 4. That's what I started with. Okay. So that's what I'm going to put here. So 4.0 times 10 to the minus 4. Now I just need my two uh, volumes. I've got 500 this time over 400 plus 500. And that's equal to 1.78 times 10 to the minus 4. And of course we should be putting units in here. Remember if you want excellence, you must have significant figures correct and all units. Right, if I can just rub this out. What we're going to do now is we know what the concentration of the two ions are in solution at the beginning of the reaction. Okay? So, what we can do is form QS. Now, QS is the same as before, PB2 plus times I minus square. Yeah? Now we've got PB2 plus as being 0 0.0133 uh, and that's times this which is 1.78 times 10 to the minus 4 all squared. So can somebody calculate that for me please? 4.21 times 10 to the minus 10. Yeah. times 10 to the minus 10. Now what we need to do is to compare that number with KS. Is it bigger or smaller? smaller? QS is actually smaller than KS, so no precipitate forms. And the reason for that is because these two concentrations are lower than the concentrations that you get if you had a saturated solution, so that number's smaller than that. Yeah. Theory 